Hi, Melissa. Good evening. How are you? How are you? I'm doing okay. How are you doing? Pretty good. I want to look like Andy just joined us as well. That's good. <laughs> we'll keep an eye for Father uh, Howell. Okay. I know, since we put him on the spot last week. Uh, <laughs> no, that's okay. I'm I'm glad he 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 jumped in. So uh, yeah. yeah, it worked out well. Yeah, it worked very well. I don't think the Archbishop is going to be joining us today. I think he mentioned it to me. I think when I saw him um, okay. last week, he said he won't be joining us today. <clears throat> How is the weather in the city? Is it better than last week? Well, I haven't been to the city. Oh, you haven't, yeah. Yeah, so, but where I am, it hasn't been too smoky these past few days. Oh man, here in San Mateo, it's uh, really, really bad. Especially oh, yeah. this morning, in the morning, it's really bad. Are the fires still raging down there? Yes, I think they say it's 35% contained, but, mm -hmm. uh, I don't know, Andy is still muted and everything. Yeah, I don't know why. <laughs> I just unmuted myself. All right. Uh, okay. All right. Maybe there uh, we go. Here now you I are. look all like I belong. I was uh, asking, you... do you have that video that we could play that opening prayer? I have it, yes. And do then we would ask, we'd ask Father Steve to lead us in the litany at the end and to give us his blessing at the end. Yes. Okay, good, good. Yeah, thanks. No, I think it's been going well. Yes, Melissa, answer your question. Somewhere along the line, I did get the um, Q&A from the last session. Okay, perfect. Yeah. And I take it that the, they've now been up and running the, the videos, because that seemed to be yes, a couple questions. Yes, they are. They yeah. are. They are. And the, the bibliography is coming for you, Fred. I, I got it from Melissa. Oh, oh okay. Yeah, is it the same one that you put on the on the thing, or you're add you added few to it? I don't know. I haven't sent anything other than the, the what was sent as uh, the powerpoints. Is that where you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I sent that, that's, one from the slides. Yeah, good, good. but yeah. if you added another one, another uh, more to it, I'll take the addition. But the one, okay. if you the water, the powerpoint, Melissa sent it to me. I got it. Yes, Thank well, you. That, it, the last one is this one that even has the books for the canonization. So, okay, yeah. Uh, I think we, that that pastor that is uh, that I have been communicating with the Lutheran one, he's interested in Jenna Peracera and the viniculture uh, with respect to the wine and, and oh. all that stuff. So that's what he also wants to know. And I said, well, mm -hmm. I don't know about Sarah and the Venicar short thing, but you can contact Andy. Maybe he can direct you to the right path. Right. Uh, there are a number of people who do studies on wine, and that's not one of my areas. <laughs> but yes, there are there are people who do that, and, and especially up in the Napa area, people have tried to make a connection between uh, Junipero Serra and the bringing the grapes to California. Well, he's in Van Nuys, so oh, I, I don't I don't the know if definitions. There's Father Stephen. Oh, Father Steve. He's muted. Yeah, I'll we'll probably just. So, was the question if they grew grapes and everything at the missions? Well, yes, uh, we know that the grapes came up from Mexico. The friars brought them up because that's where the beginning of uh, the wine industry in California is because they needed mass wine. 
So they grew grapes. Makes sense, yeah. <laughs> make the wine, just like they brought the olive trees so they could squeeze the olives to have oil for the religious ceremonies. But then it turns into other purposes. And yeah. so the, the wine vintners like to you know, make a connection if they can, which of their grapes maybe were even part of what was the original crops grown at the missions. Is there a way to tie in? It doesn't seem that I can get into this. I think we're hearing you. Can you hear me? You're, you're uh, pretty soft. Andy, but... Andy uh, this is uh, Father Howell. I Good. have a question. Uh, yeah. There was a book that came out oh, 10, 15, 20, maybe more years ago. Uh, the retired Archbishop of Birmingham, England, uh, Kirf de Murville, uh, wrote a book, uh, The Man Who Founded California, The Life of Blessed Junipero Serra. Correct, yes. Have I you know. heard of it, and what's your reaction to it? It was a pretty picture book. Um, he apparently, I don't know if he had ever visited here, but... Well, actually, he did. He, uh, he stayed at Star of the Sea. I knew that when I, when I was the administrator of Star of the Sea, I was told that he had stayed there for a month or two. Oh, okay. Yeah, it, 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 you could tell he was an out-of-towner, but he was devoted. There was nothing errors wrong with it. It just, it was more on the pious vein. Yeah. I guess it was a faculty gift at Sarah High School. <laughs> oh. That was um, 10 years ago. Oh, okay. And um, Steve, the Archbishop says he won't be able to join us tonight, so we're going to go back to Plan B from last week. I have a video that we're going to play, that Melissa's going to play for the opening prayer. But okay. if, if you would lead us in the litany at the end and give us a blessing at the end. I will. Uh, by the way, another question, okay. uh, which uh, since other people are listening, I probably shouldn't even say. Have, you've, you are obviously tied in with uh, uh, the Franciscans. Yes. Are you or have you ever considered the secular Franciscans as something to consider joining? I have, um, but um, haven't really been involved much here in California. I mean, anywhere with them. They, they come and they visit me every now and then and ask for information on Sarah. Um, but uh, no, I've never joined the Third Order. Well, if you're ever interested, I belong to the Mount Alverno fraternity in uh, Redwood City. Oh, it's okay. a rather interesting group, yes. uh, and if you would ever like to uh, give it a trial run, uh, please feel free to give me a call, and especially right. after this COVID-19 thing is over, we can yes. meet face-to-face. -face. Right, uh, because I know there was a, a lady who contacted me at Mission Dolores wanting to have a transitus on Saturday, October the 3rd. And we kind of left it up in the air because we didn't even know if we're going to be open yet on October the 3rd. But she was going to try to get the Third Order groups in the Bay Area all to come on pilgrimage to Mission Dolores for a afternoon service because many people are up in years and don't like to travel in the evening. True. But I don't know. Did we hear something new from the mayor today that maybe churches are going to open again soon? No. There was, uh, the Archbishop did uh, uh, issue a statement uh, basically to the mayor, to the uh, health commission and the like, uh, asking for uh, fairness in uh, the city and county of San Francisco uh, yeah. for outdoor masses. Uh, with more than 12, since both San Mateo and most of the other counties allow uh, for quite a bit more. Oh, okay. I'm really just trying to find out if my barber shop's going to open up or not. What they county? are. They are. San Francisco. San they Francisco. are. They are indoors yeah. or outdoor only? Uh, they are doing it uh, both indoors and outdoors. No, okay, San, San Mateo County for sure is indoors. I don't know about San Francisco. All right, I'll have to check. Fred, 
Uh, my, father, my father in Mowbray uh, was trained on 24th Street in the city. So uh, I have been going to 24th Street Barbers even when I'm down at Mowbray for it. At, uh, he was trained at 21st Street in San Francisco? 24th. 24th Street? Yeah. The barber Where shop, is... it's on property that's owned by St. Peter's. It's adjacent to uh, the back there, St. Ian's Hall. Uh, uh, it, it's, a, it's a bookstore now. But for years, from the time I was a kid, I had my hair cut there. Oh, wow. <laughs> but it's, uh, this guy is connected to it. Oh, I see. I didn't know that. Father C, we can't see you. There we now go. Now we can. More better? Much better. <laughs> How many people do we have checked in so far tonight? It uh, looks like we have 36 right now. All of a sudden, the numbers will move up. It says 41 at the bottom of my thing at this point. It's like the election counting night. It just keeps, <laughs> going. <laughs> it just keeps going up and up and up. Yeah. Well, you call it, Fred, whenever you're ready. We know our routine. Uh, it's, uh, let's wait till Father comes back, and then oh, maybe yeah. we can start. Uh, I have had quite a few complimentary emails this week. I'm sure and, uh, and I, I got some, yeah. And I've had invitations from different groups to either come and speak at their organization when COVID is over, or if I would be able to do a Zoom presentation for their group meetings. So, well, you can do Zoom now since you're becoming an expert via on Zoom. I, all uh, I and know is can... how to click in. I have, gosh, <laughs> well, that's all you I have to do. Jeremiah, you do all the work <laughs> for me. I was very fortunate in getting those two brothers to be able to cooperate and assist me. Otherwise, you would just be looking at me. <laughs> all right. Okay. Uh, maybe we can begin. Uh, again, I uh, would like to welcome you all to our last session uh, on San Juniper Serra with Andy and joining us, Father uh, Stephen Howell. And again, without further ado, Andy, it's all yours. Thank you. We'll start Thank with the prayers. And, and well, you were going to give about how we do Q and A and such. Oh. Uh, as, uh, sorry, uh, the questions uh, at the end of the session, there will be an opportunity for each and everyone to ask questions. You can please write your question either at the Q&A section or at the chat section. Melissa and I will take turns in reading the questions to Andy and he will respond. Also at the end of the session, Andy will have his email uh, listed. So if your question has not been answered or you need further clarification, uh, please feel free to add, to email Andy and he has always been more than happy and generous to respond to your emails. With the response. And also he will have additional bibliography at the end free to, uh, if you want to read more, about the, the process, the canonization process, uh, please avail yourself after the bibliography uh, provided by Andy. Uh, and also with us is Father Steve, and he's a historian. He's, uh, again, so he's full of knowledge and expertise as well. So we can learn from the two experts over here about San Jennifer. Thank you, Tom. And without further, we can begin with a prayer. Well, wait, wait. Let me, uh, let me give a bit of an intro, Melissa, okay? Okay. Um, this evening, the Archbishop sends his apologies that he's not available to join us, but he asks that um, we understand that he's very supportive of this program. And tonight, like we said, we have Father Stephen Howe who is our Vicar General in the Archdiocese of San Francisco. So we're honored to have him be present with us and he will lead us in the Litany of Junipero Serra at the very end 
and offer us his blessing. To begin with this evening, there's a video that we played the first time, and uh, you might recognize the voice on it. It was prepared back in 2012 or 13 for the 300th anniversary of Junipero Serra's birth. And it belongs with a video prepared on Junipero Serra called Always Forward, Never Backwards. And you can find it in the EWTN catalog. And it was a movie that was sponsored by the Knights of Columbus and the Sarah cause uh, were among the funders of that project. So it's, it's a movie a video that has our endorsement. But we begin with our prayer tonight. And it, this is why in 2013, it addresses him as blessed in April since he's yet to be canonized at that time. O oh Lord Jesus Christ, reward the apostolic zeal of your servant, Blessed Junipero, who, leaving home and fatherland, labored for the salvation of souls in Spain, Mexico, and California. Graciously provide by evident signs and prodigies that he may be glorified, so for the exaltation of your most holy name, he may be raised to the full honors of the altar. Grant that through his intercession, I may obtain the grace that I desire. Amen. It may be hard to believe, but I think it took us 15 takes to get it just right because they wanted me to have that crescendo at the end down to the amen. But anyway, Father Sarah, the, the dream has come true. He is canonized as a saint. And tonight we're going to talk about the making of a saint. So Melissa, if you would go to the first slide and then we'll move through this. Because I have basically, folks, you're gonna find out tonight's gonna to be a lot of storytelling because for the last, from the year 1978, I was involved in, in the end of this process that had been going on for a long time. So the next slide is a bit of a comical one, but it is a bit of a difficulty if you can press to the canon slide. You see there, I didn't design this slide. I was at a conference of Indian people, California Mission Indy descendants, about two weeks after the canonization had been announced. So this is late January, early February of 2015. You want cheese on yours? And uh, I looked over to the... So you want just the tortilla with the meat and guac and a little bit of cheese? Yeah. Okay, I'll bring it to you. So I looked over to the laptop of the Indian man sitting next to me, and he had this slide on it. I, I loved it. I thought it was great. And he thought he was impressed that I was enjoying it we should you know that he was preparing a slideshow that was talking about all the not so good things about Father Sarah. But he and I became kind of conversational buddies that day since we were sitting next to each other at the table. Then the next day when we went round the table and started talking about how we were feeling about missions and Indians and canonization, and somebody says, well, Andy, how are you feeling right now? Because the Pope has finally announced the canonization. And this is something you've been working on for 25 or more years. And the man standing next to me, his name is Stan Rodriguez. He kind of looked at me. He says, you like Father Sarah? And it, it, he, was, he was incredulous. There was no way. He just couldn't. How, how could you like that guy? After all he did. And I could not have had a better opening among a Native community. There were probably 25 people at the table. And the questions were begged and I was able to begin answering how I knew Junipero Serra. I didn't convince anybody, but they were all respectful of my position. And I thought that was something unique and wonderful. So if you would turn to the next slide, this is how we begin tonight. What is a saint? And a saint in the Christian tradition 
is someone whose holiness is recognized as exceptional by other Christians. In this case, it takes one to know one. This is not to say that the saint makers must themselves be saints, only that Christians must be able to recognize sanctity when they see it. And most of us who pray in a parish community, we, we will sometimes say, oh, that gentleman or that lady over there, he or she, they're a saint. And we mean it because we have known them. They are elders in our community and we follow their example. And that's basically, it takes one to know one. We're all striving to be saints, but we know members in our own communities who live an exemplar life. And what happens is those people who somehow get well-known and well-recognized after they die, then the church picks up the process to officially name them a saint. In one way or another, Christians have been making saints for as long as the church has existed. In the beginning, this making of saints was a spontaneous act of the local Christian community. Today for Roman Catholics, it is a protracted, painstaking process orchestrated by officials of the Vatican and governed by legal norms and procedures. I've heard it described simply as the most complicated legal process devised by an Italian because the Romans are the ones. And if you know Roman law, it's very complicated. But the laws that guide the making of a saint are so complicated that no one slips through the cracks. We have seen this in our own church, in our own country in the, in the past year and in the past decades as the process of naming somebody gets to venerable, beatification, canonization, and then even suddenly where something new is revealed, the whole thing is shut down. We still don't know what's the, gonna be the results of Archbishop Fulton Sheen, but he had been scheduled for beatification and then there was a wrinkle, something was thrown in and Rome stopped it because they wanna investigate it to make sure to be able to answer the accusations to be able to move forward. So um, saint making business really was codified in church law in the 13th century, in the 1200s, because as we remember from the first session on St. Francis of Assisi, Francis was canonized as saint two years after he died. That was a very quick process. And the only reason why it took a while is because when Francis dies in Assisi, the Pope is away in Rome. Had the Pope probably been in Assisi when Francis died, Francis would have almost immediately been canonized. And we have that case example when about 40 years later, St. Clair of Assisi dies and the Pope happens to be right there at her bedside. Some of you may know the story of Claire trying to get her rule of poverty approved by the Pope. And the Pope keeps saying, well, I'm not sure. It might be too tough of a rule for you ladies to try to follow. So the Pope comes to St. Claire's death, death, deathbed and says, Lady Claire, is there anything I can do for you? And she says, yes, approve my rule of life. And so the Pope approves her rule of life the, the, the rules and constitution of the clares. Then as she has died, the Pope says, well, let's go to church and let us now chant the office of virgins. And there was a canon lawyer, a bureaucrat there who said, Holy Father, you've just approved a whole new process for canonization. You can't do that because if you chant the office of virgins, you have canonized her you can chant the office of the dead. And some of us happen to know some people who are canon lawyers in our archdiocese. And it's not that they're being, um, you know, a stick in the mud in the process. It's just, they wanna make sure that we follow the established process. And that's what happened with St. Clair. And then they went through the process and eventually they had her canonization ceremony. But, Canonization, next slide please, cannot begin the process until 
five years after the individual is dead. So here we go back to what is the recreated room, the cell of Junipero Serra at the Carmel Mission. If you've ever visited Carmel and you've walked through the museum, you come to this recreated room. It's a room that's built probably about the spot where Father Sarah's room had been. But as we all know in California missions, it's part of the Franciscan tricks because one door down, after you've had the sentimental emotional moment at his death cell is the gift shop, selling all kinds of Junipero Serra memorabilia. It's intentional at our California missions that it happens this way. But the process that was set up in the Code of Canon Law that was way back in the 13th century, then it was in 1917 under Pope, uh, help me out, Father, uh, uh, after Pius X is Benedict. Benedict the 15th. Benedict the 15th, that Code of Canon Law that comes out, again, ratifies the same process. And then in the 1982 or three code that John Paul II promulgated, the process is there again. So it's a legal process and it says the investigations cannot begin until five years after the individual has died. Here's the reason, because there may be something that comes up about the person within that five years that then the church says, oh, we better go carefully with it. Now we know in our own recent history of the church, there have been a couple of causes, cases, where the five-year rule has been put aside. Pope Benedict did that for Pope John Paul II's case. And I think Pope John Paul II did that for Mother Teresa's case, that the five-year delay was dispensed with. And, and that's because, as we all know, the Roman Catholic Church is not a democracy. There is only one vote that counts. And in the entire church, that's the Pope. In our local diocese, it's the local archbishop or bishop who has the final say. So universally, the Pope is the one who has the say. So unfortunately for Father Sarah, next slide please, it took a little bit more than five years for his case to begin because he would have been totally drifted into obscurity had not his student and colleague, Fray Francisco Paolo, written his hagiographical, and I'm not going to butcher the, the, the Spanish right now, Reluxion, his account of Father Junipero Serra's life. Paolo was at Mission Dolores, the years 1984, 1784 to 1785. And while he was there at Mission Dolores, he said to himself, I have to write this down. Everybody back home, he meant on the island of Majorca, has to know what a treasure we had in our native son, Junipero Serra from the island of Majorca. So Paolo writes in the tradition of Franciscan Chronicle, Lives of the Saint, and it's published, and its publication shaped nearly every subsequent everything subsequently written about Sarah and the California missions. So in 1784 to 85, the year after Sarah dies, his student who had been with him from Majorca as a student who comes to him as a, with, as a missionary to Mexico, who's with Sarah in Baja, California, in Alta, California, he writes Sarah's life story. And that becomes the primary source of information about Junipero Serra because Father Serra's case is not really picked up until 150 years after he dies. And this book becomes the source of that information. Next slide, please. So at Carmel Mission, and that's where this photo is inside the sanctuary at Carmel Mission, people have these traditions stories, sometimes they're called legends, about Junipero Serra and the early Franciscan Padres. So ironic, there is this priest who is the restorer of the Carmel Mission in the late 1880s, and he has this really wonderful name, Father Casanova. And so Father Casanova decides to answer the people's concerns 
And you can see here in the photograph, the graves that we have seen before, uh, Father Junipero Serra, Father Juan Crespi, Julian Lopez, and Fermin Francisco de la Sawen. They are opened up and the burial pits are examined. Next slide, please. And so to satisfy the desires of many people who wanted to see the graves of the Reverend Fathers buried in the sanctuary of the Church of San Carlos, that's the Carmel Mission, and determined by means of the burial, burial registers, their locations and remains, Father Casanova had the graves opened and found the remains in good state of preservation. Three of the deceased were wearing their violet stoles still in a very good state. Franciscans generally, are, the priests are buried with a purple stole because they hear confessions. And when they're put in the coffin, that's the only way if you're looking down at a man in a brown robe and you're trying to figure out, was this guy a priest or a brother? And the only way you're gonna know any difference, the priest has stoles on. That's the only difference in their, in their coffins, okay? The stoles they found wearing on July 3rd were taken up and pieces were distributed as mementos, which the people wanted. It appears the bodies had been buried in lime, where there was much lime in the coffins and the remains were, one might say, encased in it. I know we might get a question in chat, why lime? Because lime helps the body decompose quickly. And as these bodies were buried inside the church, one would not want to have a particular aroma, which is not the odor of sanctity, but an aroma coming up right there from the church floor. So the coffins were filled at the time of burial with lime to speed up the process of decomposition. After the examination of the remains, the vaults were covered with the same stone slabs which they had been before. Next slide, please. So this is 1882. Every year, the Congregation of the Saints, some of you know that church there in the middle of this photograph, that's St. Peter's Basilica in Rome, for the causes of saints. Now, the office of the Congregation of Saints, if you follow the colonnade in there in the circle, and you come to the left side, then you come across the street from the colonnade, and at the bottom there is a bookstore called the Catholic Shop, the Catholic Bookstore. Libere Edifici or something or other. Anyway, upstairs is the office of the Congregation of Saints. It's right there at the doorstep of the Vatican. Okay, so ancient causes that as servants of God who died so long ago that they are no longer any witnesses who can testify to their heroic virtues. Some of these cases, such as Padre Junipero Serra have retained such popular devotion and historical interest that their beatification seems almost super, superfluous. I got that word down this time. Okay, superfluous. Next slide, please. So 150 years later, the sesquicentennial, that's another one I can say, of Padre Junipero Serra's death. Exactly 150 years after his death, the California State Senate declares 28 August 1934, Junipero Serra Day. Now this person, this bishop, Most Reverend Philip Schur, who's the Bishop of Monterey, Fresno, he is the major conduit for jumpstarting the canonization process. Here's the backstory. A young Father Schur was a priest of the Diocese of Los Angeles. And when he was newly ordained, probably around 1917, 1919, he's assigned to the diocesan parish in the city of Santa Barbara, just down the hill from the old mission. And as a newly ordained young priest, apparently for confession, in other words, to have his confession heard, he would go up to the Franciscans. And he became very interested in the Franciscan life since the headquarters for the Franciscans of California is Old Mission Santa Barbara. Well, after about a year or two of this encountering with the friars, he decides, and this happens occasionally, 
that a diocesan priest who's already ordained, he decides that he would like to switch and become a Franciscan. So he goes through the process, gets permission, gets a special dispensation, and starts the novitiate as a Franciscan brother. He's a priest already, but he must start the novitiate. After about six months in novitiate, after all these permissions have been granted, dispensations made for an already ordained diocesan priest, somewhere along the line between him and the novice master and the guardian, they decide, you know what, Father Schur, you're not cut out to be a Franciscan. Stay with the diocese. So Father Schur stays with the diocese, and then 20 years later, he ends up becoming the Bishop of Monterey. When he becomes Bishop of the Diocese of Monterey, Fresno, he is still devoted to the Franciscans, and now he realizes one of the parishes in his diocese is the Shrine in Carmel, where Junipero Serra is buried. And Bishop Schur approaches the Franciscans and says, we need to get his canonization process going. At this time, the Franciscans were a little concerned that someone who had once tried to become a Franciscan is now a bishop and they have to respect that. But now this bishop is wanting to push the cause of one of the Franciscans. So much, so much that Bishop Schur doesn't get response from the California friars that he goes to Rome. He goes to the Congregation of Saints and says, I have a saint buried within one of my churches. I want the process to begin. At the Congregation of Saints, they're thinking this is a Franciscan, the cause belongs to the Franciscans. So they go over to the Franciscan headquarters there in Rome and say, you've got a bishop who wants to get a cause going. We have to answer the bishop. Now, the Franciscans, you have an opportunity. You can appoint your own vice postulator, the person who would study the cause. And if you don't, we're gonna to have to let the bishop pick one of his diocesan priests to be the vice postulator. Well, the Franciscans would have none of it. So they decided we'll appoint a vice postulator, a person who begins to ask the questions, okay? Postulator, he poses questions. And they picked Father Gus Holbrick. Now, Father Gus Holbrick was the vicar provincial. He was rector of the seminary. He was in charge of so many other jobs that the Franciscans knew, well, Gus won't do anything because he's too busy, but we'll keep the bishop happy because we appointed a vice postulator. 1941 comes along and the bishop is back in Rome. And he's telling Rome, those Franciscans haven't done a thing to move Father Sarah's cause along. Either they appoint a new vice postulator who will do something, or I will appoint one of my diocesan priests to take up the cause. So the Franciscans this time have to appoint somebody who actually will do something, not just a placeholder. This is now 1941. They're thinking first about appointing Father Maynard Geiger, who is their greatest historian, who is writing and researching books about Junipero Serra. And Father Geiger says, don't appoint me, because when the investigations begin, I'm your historian. And if I'm the vice postulator, they can't ask me questions. So they ask Father Geiger, who do you think should be appointed? And he gives them a job description. You need somebody who understands canon law. You need somebody who is a linguist. This person is going to have to be able to speak English correctly, speak Spanish correctly, Italian correctly, and in those days, the church language of Latin correctly. And he's going to have to be young, and he's going to have to know how to write. And so the finger pointed at a young priest who had been ordained about five or six years, Father Eric O'Brien. Now, if you remember, this is 1941. Actually, it's in the fall of 1941. The war is beginning. Pearl Harbor has yet to happen. Father Eric has decided to volunteer to be a military chaplain. And he has just received permission from the provincial council to join the army. And as he is literally packing his suitcases to go to the army, he gets a change of directive from the provincial council and says, sorry, brother, you're gonna be Father Sarah's vice postulator. And 
in the archives at Santa Barbara, we have all the literature of Father Eric O'Brien, and we even have his letter accepting this obedience to the provincial, but saying, I really wanted to go and be a military chaplain instead. And basically because he had the languages. He could, he could uh, serve and minister to many military men in different languages. But that's how Father Eric O'Brien becomes Father Sarah's vice postulator in 1941. And he remains in that position until 1958. In 1950, after having done more examinations here in California, Father Eric is now ready to go to Rome to write the Samarium, the life summary, the story that answers all the questions based on Paolo's work and recent research having been conducted by Father Maynard Geiger. To go to Rome, somebody needs to stay home in California to answer the mail, to give talks, to promote Father Sarah, basically the fundraising, to keep the cause going. At that time, my mentor, Father Noel Moholy, is a professor at the seminary at Santa Barbara in theology. He's California, born and raised in San Francisco. He knows missions, he knows Father Sarah, and he's also a linguist. He knew many languages. So Father Eric approaches Father Noel and says, would you become the American administrator of the Sarah cause? And of course, all he's told us, well, you have to answer an occasional letter and there's secretarial staff, and you might have to go out and give a talk or two. That's all you have to do. Well, he was a, a graduate school seminary professor. And so he took this on and didn't realize how much work he had accepted. Unfortunately, about six months after Father Noel accepts the position and before Father Eric leaves for Rome, Father Eric is out on a preaching mission towards Arizona and he's in a tragic car accident at a railroad track and his best friend in the priesthood, Father Pat Roddy, is killed in the car accident and Father Eric ends up in the hospital for a year or two because he has to have reconstruction surgery to his mouth, to his face, and Father Noel has to pick up the work while still maintaining his teaching position. And at this time, he was also the rebuilder of the mission at Santa Barbara, the new seminary and the chapel complex that's there at Santa Barbara. You know the old phrase, find the busiest person, give him the job and it will get done. So the Sarah cause begins to move along. So here in 1943, next slide please, you see on the left, the coffin that contains the reburied remains because they opened up Father Sarah. This is the second time that he's been exposed as it were. And you see the bones replaced in a coffin. You see the cranium, you can see some long bones there on the left, probably his arm bones. You see pieces of his pelvis and then, you know, a whole bunch of smaller bones. He's placed in a lead casket that's hermetically sealed. You see the casket on the right side that is then closed and sealed and replaced back in the same vault. The cross that you see, the cross of Keravaca that had relics in it, that is the cross that was removed. And I believe it's still on exhibit today in the museum at Carmel. Now, at the time of canonization, Pope Francis had heard about this cross and he communicated to Bishop uh, Richie Garcia, please bring the cross to Washington, D.C. I'd like to venerate it. Well, I remember after the canonization, I'm out on the front steps of the uh, Shrine of the Immaculate Conception and Bishop Garcia comes up to me and says, Andy, did the Pope give you back the cross? I can't find it. I don't know what the Pope did with the cross. He had left it in the sacristy where it was presented to him. The poor Bishop Garcia was afraid that the Pope had took it as a personal gift and we were trying to search for it, but we found it eventually and it was returned to Carmel. But here is Father Sarah one more time dug up. And in the 1940s, the great way to, they thought to preserve bones was to hermetically seal the box, which meant it had, you know, was sealed, gases were pumped in, and then it was airtight. Nobody knew what would happen when you unsealed it, 
just like 20 years ago when somebody would say, what's the shelf life of all this data that I'm putting on CD? Will it still be there 25 years from now? Well, now maybe we can try to go back to our early technology to find if we can retrieve that information. But we'll tell you later what happens in 1987 when they open the hermetically sealed box, but the cross was removed. So here we are in 1987. If next slide, please. 1987, and that's Bishop Schubza in the middle, who was the Bishop of Monterey at the time. You can see the casket behind him. And you see on the table all that is left of Father Sarah. Because when they opened the casket, the hermetically sealed, the gases came out. And if you remember that old 1930s movie, The Mummy, he all crumbled up. And poor Father Sarah, you can see at the top, there's probably the skull cap, but the rest of him pretty much fell apart. So we learn that we didn't know in 1943 what a hermetically sealed box, how it would or would not preserve it. It would preserve it until you broke the seal. So science is still developing. But anyway, the purpose of the 1987 exhumation, exhumation of the body was Father Sarah had already been declared venerable in May 1985. So the cause is moving along. In July 1987, the first miracle for beatification had been approved by the boards that examined the theological and the medical boards in Rome, approved the miracle and were ready to present it to Pope John Paul II for his approval in December 1987. So permission was given to open the grave to remove some human bone for our Catholic tradition of relics, okay? We're gonna talk a little bit about relics because I know everybody has heard something about relics, just like everybody has heard something about miracles when it comes to the canonization process. And we're gonna spend a little bit of time now talking about relics and miracles. So if you would go to the next slide, please. What is a relic? A relic in this Catholic tradition is an object connected with a canonized saint from the Latin reliquae, remains. There are three grades. First class relic. That's a part of the saint's body, a bone fragment, are usually distributed after canonization or penitential object use by a saint, that is Sarah's discipline. That's the whip that he used to beat himself with, okay? It was a tradition, a custom of the time. There was also dis discipline known as perhaps wearing a hair shirt or even a belt that had nails turned inside so that as the individual who wore it would be perforated and experience pain. There is a, um, I haven't ever heard of it approved, but I've heard it repeated and repeated enough times that when we look at photographs of Pope Paul VI at Vatican II, and he seems to be shuffling like a little old man, and he's only in his mid 60s, that he was wearing one of these nail belts to offer penance at the same time. So these are stories of how the saints practice discipline on themselves, not so much on others, but on themselves. So what's a second class relic? A second class relic is anything a saint used during his or her life. That is clothing, possessions, an ink pen that they wrote with, okay? A plate that they ate off of. Those are second class relics. Now a third class relic, is an object that has been touched to a first class relic, it's kind of like a third cousin, a piece of cloth touched to the saint's grave. Now, if I'm right, if you go back to the previous slide, Melissa, and you see there Father Sarah's body laid out, and it, if you can look closely, it's laid out on a cloth. That cloth below the bones becomes a third class relic and that cloth can then be cut up into small pieces, put
put in tiny little metals and distributed as third class relics. Basically, you don't let go of the second class relic because you keep touching other things to it to make more third class relics. Okay, so that's what I'm saying. It's, it's complicated. It's Italian. It's legal. Okay, so it is legal. So let's go to the slide after the definition of relic. So here you have, again, you remember the reliquary from the canonization mass. And missionaries throughout the history have gone to take the message of the cross and the light of the gospel to the ends of the earth. When missionaries are commissioned to go on mission, they often receive a missionary cross. The cross symbolizes that they are carrying the good news that God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that the world might be saved through him. Franciscan friar Saint Junipero Serra carried a missionary's cross. Remember that one that I said they removed from his grave and that Bishop Garcia took to Washington, D.C. so the Pope could venerate it? The missionary cross in California. In 1943, when Serra's remains were exhumed, his missionary cross was found. It was a copy of a miraculous double barrel barred cross known as the Cross of Caravaca, named for the town in Spain where it was located. Sarah's mission cross was in the form of a reliquary. If you remember, it showed that back piece opened up. There were relics inside. It contained the relics of Blessed Ramon Lul, a native of Sarah's Majorca, to whom Padre Junipero Sarah had a special devotion. And there again, you see the reliquary that was prepared for Father Sarah's canonization mass. So next slide, please. How a candidate for sainthood is evaluated. To be canonized or even beatified, the servant of God had, must have lived a life of heroic virtue and life and death, he must always have enjoyed a reputation for holiness and miracles. He must, in fact, have performed a certain number of miracles, and he must have been the object of no unauthorized religious honors. All this must be proved from historic documents and living witness. Here we go back to some more storytelling. Unauthorized religious honors. People go, what's that? It technically is a rule that you cannot have an image of somebody being considered for sainthood with the halo of a saint painted around his head until he's actually, or she, is actually canonized a saint. So a lot of times, some of that artwork that had Pope John, John the 23rd, Oscar Romero, all these other candidates for possible sainthood, and they would have a halo. Everybody at Rome would say, stop that, don't do that. You're gonna cause us difficulties in the process because that's part of the rules. Here's the other thing. We always hear the term miracles come into play when we're talking about the canonization. Rome never asks for a miracle until we get to the point of the person having been declared venerable. Because everybody seems to think it's all about miracles. What the process is, is you must first prove the individual lived the life of a saint and live the virtues to a heroic degree. We're all called as Christian to live the theological and the cardinal virtues, but a saint is called to live those virtues to a heroic degree, above and beyond. You remember those people we know in our parishes that we look over and we say, he or she is a living saint. Think of the virtues, why we make those statements when we're at church about certain individuals we all love and respect. Well. Here in the case of Father Sarah, in 1960, he's not even venerable yet. We haven't even finished writing the Samarium to present to the Holy Father. But in 1960, in St. Louis, Missouri, there's a Franciscan sister. Her name is Sister Mary Boniface Dryda. She's probably in her 40s, if maybe late 30s. School teacher. And she begins to suffer and becomes very weak. She has a blood sister, an older sister, who's also a member of her religious community. 
And Sister Boniface gets so sick, she has to go to the hospital. And it happens that the doctors can't figure out what's wrong with her. They do write in the medical records that they believe it was lupus, a skin disease, I believe that's what it is, a cancer type of thing. And Sister Mary Boniface is asking all the sisters in her community and everybody they all know to please pray. And she's talking to Sister, to St. Teresa Lazou, to all the saints, you know, Francis and Clara, because she's a Franciscan. Please, please intercede for Sister Mary Boniface and get her a miracle. As it happens, the chaplain at the hospital was a Franciscan priest, Father Marion Habig who worked for St. Anthony's Press. Some of you may have read his books back in the 1960s. He walks in, finds out that Sister Boniface is not in good shape, and then finds out that she's been asking everybody to pray to all these various saints to help her. Father Marion says to Sister Boniface, you know what, there's this guy out in California. Nobody's really praying to him right now. He's not too busy. Why don't you ask everybody to pray to Father Junipero Serra for you? Pray to him to intercede on your behalf that you get a miracle. So the prayer campaign begins. Everybody she knows, all the nuns know, are now talking to Father Serra to intercede to God to get Sister Boniface a health miracle. Somewhere in the course of this, the doctors say to Sister Boniface's older blood sister, because they had promised, your sister is at the end. This is it. And you promised to tell your sister when we doctors said so she could prepare herself for death properly. So Sister Boniface's sister goes into the bedroom to tell Sister Boniface, hun, the docs say this is it. Prepare yourself. And Sister Boniface says, one more time, ask everybody to pray to Father Sarah. So the word goes out, pray to Father Sarah. 24 hours later, Sister Boniface is sitting up in her bed. The doctors cannot explain what happened. The doctors do not give the judgment that it was a miraculous cure. The doctors give the judgment medically. They cannot explain what happened that the woman should be dead, but yet she's still alive. Sister Boniface writes to my mentor, Father Noel Maholi at St. Boniface Church in San Francisco in 1961. By this time, he has now taken over formally as the vice postulator in 1958. She writes to him and details her story. At this time, the Congregation of Saints is not asking for miracles. They're still asking, you have to prove this person to have lived a heroic life of virtue. Father Noel reads the letter and it goes into the file. It goes into the file. So then the process continues and the examination of Father Sarah's life continues. We'll come back to Sister Boniface after a few slides. So next slide, please. Because here are the virtues the theological virtues, all of us as Christians are called to live these virtues. To be a saint is to be judged to have lived each one of these virtues to a heroic degree, to a degree beyond. So faith is the first virtue. And the faith is the theological virtue by which we believe in God and believe all that he has said and revealed to us. Then we have hope. Hope is the theological virtue by which we desire the kingdom of heaven and eternal life is our happiness. Charity. Charity is the theological virtue by which we love God above all things for his own sake and our neighbors as ourselves for the love of God. Next slide with the cardinal virtues. Prudence. Prudence is the moral virtue that disposes practical reason to discern our true good in every circumstance and to choose the right means of achieving it. Justice is the moral virtue that consists in the constant and firm will to give their due to God and neighbor. Fortitude is the moral virtue that ensures firmness in difficulties 
and constancy in the pursuit of good. Temperance is the moral virtue that moderates the attraction of pleasure and provides balance in the use of created goods. These are the guidelines that were used to judge Junipero Serra's case. These are the same seven guidelines that were used to judge the case of John Paul II, of Mother Teresa, of Oscar Romero, of John the 23rd, of Paul the 6th, of all the saints that you can think since the 13th century, these are the questions. The same exam was given to each one of them. Once they passed this exam, that is when the Pope would declare them venerable, that the servant of God has lived the heroic virtues. Then and only then in Rome at the Congregation of Saints do they begin to ask for miracles. So the next slide, please. In July 1983, the first time I went to Rome and I met Pope John Paul II, Father Noel Maholi and I presented these first volume that you see there on the right, the summary of Padre Junipero Serra. That was volume one that we presented in 1983 to John Paul II. My mentor, Father Maholi, said to the Holy Father, that he wanted John Paul II to move forward with declaring Sarah uh, blessed. And John Paul II said to Father Maholi, and if any of you ever remember any time watching John Paul II, he used to point his finger when he made a point. And he pointed at my mentor, Father Maholi, and he said, you must insist, you must insist, you must insist. And what he meant was insist at the congregation of saints to have the process move around. That's when I was introduced to the Holy Father and the Holy Father understood that I was a native from one of the California missions devoted to Father Sarah. He pointed his finger to me and said, and you must pray, you must pray, you must pray for this canonization. And I tell people because of that moment with John Paul II, I am a believer in the power of prayer. Because every day from that day in July 1983 until the moment that Junipero Serra was canonized, I prayed for the canonization. And I think I can say, like so few people can say, I actually saw come to completion something that I prayed to God come true. I saw the canonization of Junipero Serra happen. And it was a momentous moment. But you see volume two and volume three there next to volume one? When volume one was submitted, the officials of the Congregation of Saints came back with questions. And so we had to produce volume two and volume three with answers to the questions that were generated out of volume one. But out of these documents is how Pope John Paul II then declares Junipero Serra venerable. So if you turn to the next slide, and many will remember that magic moment in September 1987, when the Holy Father comes to California and among his stops, he stops at Mission Carmel. At Mission Carmel, he goes to Sarah's grave and places flowers. We had hoped that when the Pope was in California at Carmel, that he would have proceeded with the beatification because the miracle that I'm now gonna to describe to you had been approved. But it was a legal loop that, well, the medical boards and the theological boards had approved the miracle of Sister Mary Boniface. The congregation or the consistory of cardinals had not yet met to give the official approval to the Holy Father to move forward. And so the Pope did not perform the canonization in California, but approval was received in the consistory on December the 8th, 1987. And then the canonization was scheduled for the following September of 1988 in St. Peter's Square in Rome. So let me go back to that miracle with Sister Mary Boniface. You remember in 1961, she writes to Father Noel in San Francisco and says, I had a miracle. Father Noel says, that's nice. Rome isn't asking for miracles. After Sister Mary Boniface, who's still alive at her mother house in St. Louis at this time, 
hears that Father Sarah is now venerable, she writes again to Father Noel, who's still living at St. Boniface in San Francisco. I wrote to you 25 years ago about the mir miracle cure I had through Father Sarah. You didn't ever respond to me. Maybe you'd like me to repeat that story for you now. Two days later, Father Noel was on an airplane from San Francisco to St. Louis, Missouri. He met Sister Boniface, heard her story, went to Archbishop, it was Archbishop May was in charge at St. Louis, Missouri at the time, and they opened up the official investigation into the miracle. Within a year and a half, the miracle had been documented and presented to the congregation in Rome. I was there in Rome in the summer of 1987, standing in the hallway outside. It's kind of like, you know, you, you see these scenes when we see the TV trials and people are waiting on the hallway to hear what the jury is going to say. Well, there was a commission of theologians and medical people. They were sitting at a table in a closed door room trying to decide, should we approve this miracle, approve this case as a miracle? Rome never says it's not a miracle. Rome says to the proponents of a case, you have yet to prove it to be a miracle. Well, the bottom line was the medical people could not decide what Sister Boniface was ailing from back in 1960. But what the medical people could agree on, whatever she had, the lady should be dead, but you're telling us she's alive still in 1987. So they said it's a miraculous cure. The theologians said they followed the story, the narrative of Sister Mary Boniface. It was, this was not a miracle performed by St. Francis. This was not a miracle through our Blessed Mother, through St. Clair, through any other saint. It was really clear that Sister Boniface had said, ask everybody to pray for me through Cunipero Sarah. So the procedures were followed. And if you go to the next slide, please. You see here again, 1987 in San Francisco. You remember on the right, that picture from the last time, Father Sarah is looking at the Golden Gate, well, the, the gaping hole, the entrance, and he's kind of upset that now he has to get on a boat to the other side. Well, in 1987, when the Holy Father comes to San Francisco, where does he go? There you see him standing next to Archbishop Quinn, and on the other side is Cardinal Cairoli, who was Secretary of State at the time, standing at the same spot that Junipero Serra was, and they are on their way to Mission Dolores, San Francisco. So if you go to the next slide, please, because it takes us to Mission Dolores, San Francisco, September 17th, 1987. There on the left side, you see the Holy Father praying in the sanctuary of Old Mission Dolores. And on the right, you see the photograph that went around the world for that papal trip. John Paul II hugging four-year-old Brendan O'Rourke, who had tested positive for the HIV virus. And here we had a Pope in San Francisco hugging a person suffering from AIDS. And at the time, the president of the United States, Ronald Reagan, had not even said the word AIDS. It was a dramatic, monumental moment of religion, of Catholicism, of the history of the church in California and in San Francisco. And where does it take place? But at the first place, the gospel arrives in the Archdiocese of San Francisco but at Mission Dolores. Now I know my fantasy at the time was that Brendan would have got a cure, a miracle, and then we would have had the miracle at Mission Dolores, but Brendan survived until 1990. I believe he was seven years old when he died, and the funeral was at St. Cecilia's Church. But his family very much became believers, and Brendan went with us to Rome for the beatification ceremony, and received Holy Communion from Pope John Paul II in St. Peter's Square at the Beatification Mass. The monumental thing is this, is the sanctity and the moments in the lives of people that are brought about because of 
the common denominator here is Junipero Serra. Junipero Serra and Sanctity in California. Junipero Serra and Sanctity in San Francisco. So then if you go to the next slide and you'll see another book. This is the medical records. It's only about 300 pages thick. All the medical records, all the doctor's notes on Sister Boniface's case. It is called The Miraculous Story or The Position on the Super Miracle of, through Junipero Serra. And it's based on this that John Paul II declares Junipero Serra blessed. This is the miracle case that was used for his beatification. The beatification was set for September 25th, 1988 in St. Peter's Square in Rome. And as tradition, after the ceremony, a number of people are invited to thank the Holy Father for what he just did during the beatification or canonization mass. Now, many of you have seen that, the three-part series, The Godfather. And you remember those moments when all the dons come in and they kiss the hand of the Godfather. The bacha de mano. You're, you're kissing the hand of the person in charge. Or if you've been watching the series, The Crown, you see the prime minister is kissing the hand of Queen Elizabeth. It's a very important ceremony of gratitude and of showing acknowledgement to the personage of that office. So next slide, please. So immediately after the beatification in St. Peter's Square, there is this ceremony inside the uh, Basilica Church. This time we were there in the chapel that has the Pieta. There were about a hundred of us in the room waiting for the Holy Father to come in. And then as you see there, Pope John Paul II stops and talks to everybody who has been invited in. Each case at this point, each cause, I think each one we had 10 people that could be given tickets. I remember standing on the front steps of St. Peter's Basilica with my ticket to go in, standing next to my own home bishop, Bishop John Cummins of Oakland, and the uh, Swiss guard points to me and says, go that way. And Bishop John looks at me and says, how did you get in there? And the Swiss guard looks at him and says, Bishop, bishops are a diamond dozen around here, but Indians who love Father Sarah are very few. And they, they motioned me to go on, and Bishop John kind of said, well, I'll see you later at lunch, I guess. And so I went in, and you see here, Sister Mary Boniface, the miracle nun, she is kissing the hand of John Paul II. John Paul II is having a conversation with my mentor, Father Noel Maholi, and then you see me there on the side, um, a much younger version of me, dark hair, and if you notice today, I'm wearing the same necklace that I have on that I wore when I met John Paul II there. This is a traditional family heirloom of California beads that have been handed down in our family. So if you would go to the next slide, please. We're almost wrapping this up, folks. Because then you know, in 2015, see the same necklace again? Okay, I like to reuse things. There I am, and John uh, Francis is canonizing Sarah. But the question everybody's gonna have, what was the miracle for the canonization of Junipero Serra? I asked the same question. If you remember back early on, I remember on the morning, I believe it was January 15, 2015, about four in the morning, I received a phone call, a wake up call from Reuters News Service saying, Mr. Galvin, we know you've been working on the Serra cause for years, and the Holy Father has just announced on the airplane flying to the Philippines or back to Rome from the Philippines, that when he comes to the United States, he would like to canonize Junipero Serra. Well, I was startled awake. It made me sit up in bed. And I almost wanted to say what my, what my mind was thinking at the time. What was the miracle? We've been chasing miracles for 20 years. What miracle? Did we miss something? Did some bishop take a miracle to Rome and forget to tell the cause, the, you know, the, the organization that's promoting? So I hung up the phone, started calling a few other Franciscans. Now here's the backstory. In November of, 19, of, of 2014, 
Pope Francis said to the Franciscan uh, postulator general, the guy in Rome who promotes saint causes, that he wanted to do this when he comes to the United States. So we had been alerted in November by email that the Pope wants to do this when he comes to the United States in 2015. We had no idea where he was gonna do it, how he was gonna do it, or why he was gonna do it because we hadn't submitted a miracle. But the email said, tomorrow we'll send you about 30 questions to follow up so we can complete the documentation here in Rome. Well, the next day we got the questions and among four of us, three Franciscans and myself, the questions were divided up. Two priests, one a canon lawyer, took the questions that had to do with the historical background of Junipero Serra. One young Franciscan took what had to do with popular devotion, statues and movies and pamphlets. And I was given the tough questions about Junipero Serra and Indians. We were given a deadline of Christmas Eve. This is like a few days before Thanksgiving. So we had one month to answer all these questions. Well, we pulled together our documentation and got it back to Rome on New Year's Eve. That was what, December 31st. Here on January 15th, the Pope has made a decision. We know that we sent the documentation to Rome. It was gonna take the translator there in Rome about a month to translate it. Then it was gonna to have to be published and edited and reviewed. We figured the Holy Father would get the document about April. But here it was, January 15th, and the Pope is saying, because I immediately looked for the YouTube, and I was looking for somebody whispering in Francis's ear, Junipero Serra. I was looking for the Pope to maybe be holding a piece of paper that said Junipero Serra's name. He had nothing. He knew who Junipero Serra was. He knew what he intended to do and what he planned to do. And as I said before, the church is not a democracy. There is only one vote, and that's the Pope's vote. So everybody at the Congregation of Saints knew this decision. The Pope is going to do this when he goes to the United States. Now let's figure out how we make it happen. And so we had to produce the documentation in time for when there was going to be a consistory in Rome that June so the Pope could formally ask the Cardinals, should I, could I do this when I go to the United States in three months in September? But I know a number of us kept asking, where's the miracle? Canon law says you need one miracle for beatification. Canon law says you need one fresh new miracle that has occurred since the time of beatification for canonization. And the answer came back, one of the proposals that my mentor had made for years, that we had the miracle itself in the life of Junipero Serra, which is called a moral miracle. It is the same case or the same methodology that Pope Francis used to declare John the 23rd a saint. There was no second miracle in the case of John the 23rd other than there was evidence he lived a holy life, that he had a reputation, and people continued to be devoted to John the 23rd. The same thing for Junipero Serra. There was no second miracle save for his life itself was a life that was reputed to be one of a holy person. And that is how we get to the canonization of Junipero Serra. Now, just to bring the story to the dramatic conclusion, there was no Bache de Mano ceremony in Washington, D.C. after the canonization. But if you go to the next slide, Melissa, there was what Rome calls, it wasn't a meeting, because then it would have to have been published. It was a private encounter of the Holy Father and representatives of Indian descendants who had had ancestors at the nine missions in California that had been founded by Junipero Serra. So the criteria to be invited to meet the Holy Father was one, you had to genealogically prove that you had ancestors at one of Serra's nine missions. I could do that. There were other people that could do that too. Two, you had to be a practicing Catholic. Three, you'd behave when you were presented to the Holy Father. 
okay? And four, your local bishop had to approve you. With those four things, we were allowed to be presented to the Holy Father. And there were two of us from every one of the nine Sarah missions who were able to meet Pope Francis in a private encounter. There was no planned speech by the Holy Father. There was no dramatic Swiss guard clicking their heels as the Pope walked in the room. We were standing downstairs outside the cafeteria at the National Shrine, right next to the gift shop, lined up down the hallway. And suddenly there at the door was the Holy Father. He came down and talked to each one of us. He had a translator with him. If he didn't understand your language, somebody, a young priest was whispering into his ear, translating into either Spanish or Italian. And we would speak in English or whatever. Many of us spoke Spanish. And so we're able to speak directly to the Holy Father. I presented the Holy Father. You can see there in my hand, I had a rosary that years before I had with me and St. Pope John Paul II had blessed. And so I showed it to the Holy Father and I said, Pope John Paul II bless this and I have a personal intention that I'm praying for. Would you also bless this rosary so that it will continue the, that intention? And the Holy Father, as you can see, he complied and he blessed the rosary. I then asked the Holy Father to come to California. I told him, I would meet him in San Diego with the bus and we would drive to all the California missions so he could visit and see the places where Junipero Serra planted the cross. Well, he hasn't yet taken up mommy on my offer, but he did smile and said, I would like to come to California. Let's hope, because I tell you this one thing, I know if he makes it to Mission Dolores, I know who the museum director is that will be giving that tour to the Holy Father that time. Now, before we open it up for questions and answers, I want to sum up the whole purpose of these four sessions that I saw that I was giving. And this is what I read at the very beginning. Today, one becomes a little skeptical when one looks at history. Is it really worthwhile to take so much trouble to engage in historical research to publish and to lose so much time in the study of the history of the church, of the mission, and of the history of the Franciscan. After all, those historical records are lying there, dry as dust in the archives. In retrospect, nothing can be changed now anyway. The present and the future are by far much more important. It still lies within our powers and it is our responsibility to form it in a rational way. And I wanna just jump to the conclusion at the end because this was my purpose. I wish to have present here an overview of the Christian understanding and motivation of evangelization. The Franciscan charism as inspired by Francis of Assisi. And finally, something as to those gray robe wonders of the cross who first brought the gospel to this part of the world. That was my goal. I hope folks that I've achieved it in these four presentations. And my conclusion is to quote Father Junipero Serra when he concluded in the classroom to his students, to you those who have been learning from me. Should it happen that you hear of my demise, my death, that you would say a prayer for me, and wish me Godspeed to eternal paradise. And I, upon hearing of your death, would wish you the same prayer and the same speed to the eternal bliss. Thank you very much, folks. Now we'll take some questions. Is everyone that spellbound? <laughs> All right, so it looks like our first question is, in a previous class, you mentioned that Junipero Serra met with expelled Jesuits on a ship where they were, they were incarcerated. Can yes. you please give me a citation for the primary source on this? I'm very interested in the topic. That would be, remember that book I said that is the life of Junipero Serra written by Francisco Palo. So if you go to the final slides that has the bibliography, you'll see it there. 
or if you even go to The Life and Times of Junipero Serra by Maynard Geiger, Dr. Maynard Geiger, you will see it in there. So it's a lot of the writings of the Franciscans from, well, Paolo himself, and then Francis Guest and Dr. Maynard Geiger from the 1950s through the 1970s. But that is well documented about Sarah meeting the Jesuits on the boat. Okay, um, also, can you speak to the practice of relics placed in an altar? Yes. Or monstrance, there's a second question. Okay, it's basically in an altar. During the early Christian times, as you remember, Christianity was down in the catacombs and mass was said on the tombs of the saints. When Christianity became legal and they came out of the catacombs, as a remembrance of saying the first masses, celebrating Eucharist on the tombs of saints, the early martyrs of the church, they began to have the custom of having a bone of one of those saints embedded in an altar stone that was then placed inside the main altar table so that we could remember the saints of the past and to have them near us during the celebration of Eucharist. In the one, more, one more comment on that. Uh, since I believe it was the late 60s, uh, new altars are not required to have a relic of the saints in them. Up to that point, the expectation was that there would be a relic of some sort, uh, an altar stone. Uh, but like I said, I don't know the exact date, but it was the late 60s that it was decreed that new altars did not necessarily need to have a relic. But if you go today to a dedication of a new church, one of the major events is the presentation of relics that are placed mm -hmm. probably beneath the altar or inside the altar proper itself somehow. So, you know, folks find ways to go around, you know, legalistic as we are, there's always a way. We always say the Italians have that butt clause that we're going to try to do it this way, but if you still like the custom, figure out a way to make it happen. But yes, uh, you're correct. The, yeah. the legal requirement is no longer exist. There's a question over here. What of uh, Jennifer Sarah's life would be, of, would be in the archives at Carmel Mission? Are they open to the public? Most of the document, well, most of the archives if you're a qualified researcher, okay, that means a historian or somebody with an academic degree will, is allowed access. You know, it's like a research library. At Carmel, the archives for Carmel are actually at the Diocese of Monterey's offices. And there they have all the old mission registers, et cetera. And you need to make contact with the archivist of the Diocese of Monterey Usually what they ask is, what are you looking for? Tell us what you're looking for. Let us find it first. Once we find it, then you would be allowed to come in and under our supervision to review our documents, okay? Um, most of the Junipero Serra documentation is at Old Mission Santa Barbara because that's where all the Serra memorabilia, the Serra archives, his original writings and papers. At Mission Dolores, we have our baptismal register and it was begun by Junipero Serra. And actually, like on about the 14th page, where he actually baptizes at Mission Dolores, we see his signature on the document. Well, apparently some researcher had come in and realized this is rare, signature of Junipero Serra, and they removed the page. They tore it out of the book, okay? And maybe 50 years later, somebody researching somewhere found this page and they returned it to Mission Dolores. So you might understand why archivists and museum people are very protective of the documents. They, they just don't let anybody in to look at them. You may say, well, I'm not going to do anything wrong, but it's very difficult because these are rare documents. You have to have gloves on and you can't have, you can't have a cup of hot co coffee sitting next to you. It's in, you know, very much um, a situation that protects the documents. But for Junipero Serra, the bulk of the documentation is at Old Mission Santa Barbara, and they actually have 
the old Mission Santa Barbara Mission Archive Library, and you contact them because they are managing the Sarah Cause materials. Um, another question, uh, can you tell us a little about your journey? How did you become curator? I heard you evolve in your belief in Sarah, question mark. Well, I'll put it this way. I was on the board of directors of the California Missions Foundation, which was established in 1998. And in 2003, we learned that the then curator, my predecessor, Brother Guire Cleary, Cleary, was being transferred by his religious community. And we as a board at the foundation that gives money to missions, didn't want to then give the money to the pastor because most pastors will say, oh, we got this money. Well, yeah, the mission needs a little museum work, but we got to fix the pipes that run the toilets in the elementary school. So let's use that money for that. So it was a stopgap to make sure that funding and museum work at Mission Dolores would continue. So the board said, Andy, you live in that area. That's your mission anyway. You have family there. You know, it wouldn't take that much for you to just step in maybe 15 hours a week be the museum director, and then we wouldn't be concerned about sending money to Mission Dolores for the museum projects because there would be some oversight from a museum type of person. Well, I interviewed, at the time the pastor was Father Bill Justice. You know, that old burnout from the 60s, carry a banner in the 1968 protest. <laughs> Bill was, I told Bill, he was a burnout from the 60s and I loved working for the man. Well, when he hired me, we, I sat down and he says, Andy, I'm going to, I know I'm going to hire you, but I'm going to give you a few conditions. And the first thing he said was, I want you to tell the truth about what happened to Indians at missions. That's when I knew he really was a burnout from the 60s because I looked at him incredulous because I couldn't believe what I was hearing because that's what I always get in trouble for is telling the truth of what happened to Indians. And I guess Father Bill saw the look on my face and he says, now, wait a minute, wait a minute. Remember what Chairman Jesus said. Chairman Jesus said the truth so set us free. Then I knew I was going to enjoy working at Mission Dolores because the administration was supportive of what I wanted to do. Then the next thing Father Bill said, if you ever say anything that you think the Archbishop might call me up and say, why did Andy say that? Be sure you can give me your footnotes, Andy, so I can explain to the Archbishop. Well, the Archbishop at that time, you know, was Leveda. The years I was there that Leveda was Archbishop, never once a question to Bill that I'm aware of about anything Andy had said. His successor, Father Niederauer, he came over, he took tours with me, he enjoyed listening to me, complimented me on my English because Archbishop Niederauer said, Andy, you speak as if all these people are alive to you. You speak of Father Sarah, Father Palo, and all the Indians in the first person. You don't speak of them in the past. So I never had any questions from Niederauer. Then Niederauer was succeeded by you know who. And then there were questions. And by that time, Father Bill is Bishop Bill. And it's very good because I enjoy also working for our current Archbishop because he will ask a question. And if you give him the correct answer, not the answer he's looking for, but the truth and a correct answer, he will then tell you, this is how you should do it. And this is how I'm comfortable with you doing it. And then he'll look at you and say, keep up the good work. I have never not felt supported in my work at Mission Dolores. The same goes for the pastors, Father Bill, then Father Art, and now Father Francis. They may not totally understand or agree with what I do, but I do feel their support in what I do because they know my goal is to promote the California Indians and also to promote Father Junipero Serra, which means bottom line, everything promotes our Catholic faith. And so I got to Mission Dolores simply because somebody was needed to fill a slot and I have had the time of my life. I've been there since 
three, four. So what is it, 16, 17 years almost? And I know they're probably saying, when is he gonna go? Because we have people that get to missions and they stay there for 25, 30 years. My 30 years isn't up yet. I'm only 65. Maybe at 75, they'll be justifying saying, when is he gonna go? But until then, if I can re keep remorphing Mission Dolores as we are doing tonight, to stay with the times, to represent Mission Dolores and the history of the friars and the Indians, then I, there's value in me being there. But when I become an antique, that's the time you dust me off, put me on the shelf and find my successor. I hope that answered the question. Oh. Um. LA Diocese has a protocol for mission Indians to hold traditional ceremony on mission ground. Does San Francisco and Oakland Diocese have something similar? Presently, there's no written protocol. However, I would imagine if you approach the pastors at Mission San Rafael, Mission San Francisco, Mission San Jose, especially at the University of Santa Clara, all the missions in this area, that the pastors would say, please, let's see how we can work this out. And then the people would be invited in. It would be good to have a protocol like Los Angeles has that fits our area. But sometimes why go through the formality of a document when you don't need it? Because simply if native peoples ask permission, then it happens. So that needs to be the question. Have Native people been denied access to the missions to do this? And then the question also becomes, they're Catholic missions. What is it that would want to be done there? Because if it's something in opposition to Christianity, then it may not be appropriate to happen at a Catholic mission. We need to remember the functions of our church buildings. Maybe it's something out in a plaza, out front, maybe on the grounds, but the church buildings are dedicated Catholic worship spaces. They were built by the Indians, and yes, they were first used by the Indians, but the purpose has always been for Christian worship. Okay, um, there are a couple questions about your necklace, uh, what it's made of and what the meaning of it is. Okay, well here you see magnesite, I don't know if you can see this, Magnesite stone beads. These beads indicate a trade with the Southwest, okay? And these are also, remember in California, our economy were the beads. And when the Franciscans show up giving the Indians these glass beads, guess what they did? They destroyed the economy because many of the Indians won the glass beads that were made on the Murano Islands off of Venice instead of the clamshell beads, which are these white beads that are made from the clams here in the San Francisco Bay region. The stone here is magnesite from Minnesota. It doesn't uh, fit California, but when this necklace was put together, there was a shell here, it broke, it was replaced with this. My father said, oh, I like that red stone. It makes it look nice. So, you know, things continue and develop. So because there are, most necklaces have just one of these big magnesite stones. This necklace has a good collection of about 20 of them. This is a very family traditional heirloom. And uh, I've had archeologists tell me, do you know what that is worth? And I said, it's priceless because it's a family heirloom and they're meaning financial value. I used to have this on display in the museum at Mission San Jose. And one anthropologist who did his life career on beads said Andy take a picture of it put the picture on its display and remove it because if you lose that necklace through theft you'll never ever be able to replace it so at that time I did remove it from the exhibit and so I keep it with me and on special occasions like tonight and canonizations and beatifications and installations of archbishops and university presidents I wear it then I hope that answered that question. Um, are there any plans or visions to use the missions to further promote the work of Father Sarah's 
with the teaching and preaching the faith? I think every mission church that is a Catholic church, which is what, 19 out of the 21, every single Sunday that Mass is held and the gospel is preached there is the continuation of Junipero Serra's work. To promote his understanding, yes, we need to do that in a larger way because Junipero Serra is a saint who lived right here in California, who lived at many of our missions. And we need to make sure that we're able to deal with that situation. Again, well, uh, there are so many, so many questions. I think we can uh, email them to you, uh, Andy, and send them to you, I think, just for uh, sake of time. And again, Andy, thank you so much for giving us this wonderful four session presentation on Father Sarah and uh, I personally learned quite a bit of things that I didn't know. And I wanted to thank you and I thank Melissa and thank Father Steve uh, and uh, the Archbishop for putting this uh, four sessions to enlighten uh, the faithful and the parishioners of the Archdiocese and the, the people of the Archdiocese about their faith and what uh, truly St. John Priscilla stood for. Again, thank you so much, Andy. Uh, for everything you have done. I really appreciate it. And Father Stephen, thank you so much again for everything you have, uh, you know, given us and provided us with your guidance and support and your help and your wisdom. And Melissa, uh, I couldn't have done it without you. Thank you so much uh, for your IT. Uh, you're talking to a dinosaur like myself. So I really appreciate <laughs> everything you have done. And I think we can conclude with a prayer. Uh, and I don't know if Andy wants to say something and Father Steve and... Uh... Well, I'd like to just say thank you to the invitation to make these presentations. And again, like you just thank Melissa for her help. If it was not for Lionel and Joshua Jeremiah, the brothers Jeremiah, this dinosaur would have stood here <laughs> with a written out text as a old-fashioned classic podium bound lecturer and you would not have had any pictures or drawings or anything it would have been the old-fashioned way but i am indebted to joshua and lionel jeremiah brothers who helped put this all together for me because as you remember melissa and fred our first conversation i said this is great but who's going to do the powerpoint or who's going to fix the slides who's going to do this and you said it's really easy andy we'll teach you and I said, but I don't want to learn. And then fortunately, one time in a conversation, Melissa said, PowerPoint. And I understood that. And in conversation, I said to Lionel and Joshua, do you guys know how to do PowerPoint? And the next thing you know, you see the results of their good work. And I'm very grateful to those two brothers who made me look so good these past four weeks. <laughs> Thank you, Andy. Yeah. And I guess I should say, like you just said, we're very grateful to the Archbishop who asked me to do these sessions through you, Fred, because we know how devoted he is to Father Sarah. And I remember, you know, many occasions that in the past years he's been supportive, but especially so since a lot of the drama began on June 19th. And uh, he's been very much in contact, asking for advice and consultation and also sharing with me future plans for promoting Junipero Serra in the Archdiocese. Yeah, thank so, you so much. And specifically on behalf of the Archdiocese, Andy, thank you for the time and effort you put into this and everything that you've shared. Uh, you are a gift and you are greatly appreciated. Thank you. Thank you, Father. <laughs> Shall we go to the prayer then? The litany. Are, are we going to do the litany, uh, Andy, the prayer? Yes. or Father Steve said he would lead us. Okay. So let us remember that we're in the holy presence of God as we join together in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Christ, Christ have, have mercy. mercy. Lord have mercy. Lord have mercy. Christ hear us. 
Christ, Christ graciously, graciously hear us. God the Father in heaven, have, have mercy, mercy on us. us. God the Son, our Redeemer, have mercy, have mercy on us. God the Holy Spirit, have, have mercy, mercy on us. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray, pray for us. Holy Father Francis, pray, pray for us. Holy Mother Claire, pray for us. Saint Juniper of Sarah, native of Petra, pray, pray, pray for us. us. Saint Juniper of Sarah, son of Mallorca, pray for us. Pray for us. Saint Juniper of Sarah, apostolic preacher, pray for us. Saint Juniper of Sarah, professor of theology. Pray for us. Saint Juniper of Sarah, doctor at the Julian University. Pray for us. Saint Juniper of Sarah, lover of Scotus. Pray for us. Saint Juniper of Sarah, missionary to the Americas. Pray for us. Pray for us. Saint Juniper of Sarah, apostle to California. Pray for us. Pray for, Pray for us. us. Saint Juniper of Sarah, Father to Indians. Pray for us. Saint Juniper of Sarah, their instructor in the faith. Pray for us. Saint Juniper of Sarah, founder of missions. Pray for us. Saint Juniper of Sarah, builder of the missions in Mexico. Pray for us. Saint Juniper of Sarah, builder of the missions in Baja California. Pray for us. Saint Juniper of Sarah, builder of the missions in Alta California. Pray, Pray for us. Saint Juniper of Sarah, long suffering. Pray, Pray for us. Saint Juniper of Sarah, peacemaker. Pray, Pray for us. Saint Juniper of Sarah, man of dauntless courage. Pray, Pray for us. Saint Juniper of Sarah, beloved son of Francis and Claire. Pray, Pray for us. Christ, hear us. Christ, Christ, hear us. Lord Jesus, hear our prayer. Lord Jesus, Jesus hear our prayer. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have, Have mercy God. on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Let us pray. O oh God, in your ineffable mercy, you chose St. Juniper of Sarah as a means of gathering many peoples of the Americas into your church. Grant that through his intercession, our hearts may be united to you in ever greater love, so that at all times and in all places we may show forth the image of your only begotten Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. And the blessing to bring this to closure is one that was used by St. Francis, and actually he wrote to Brother Leo, but it's one that Unipro of Sarah would have used, as all the Franciscans do, and is included as one of the options in our Roman Missal. So we'll start on our heads and pray for God's blessing. May the Lord bless us and keep us. Amen. Amen. May the Lord let his face shine upon us and be gracious to us. Amen. Amen. May the Lord look upon us kindly and give us his peace. Amen. And may the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit, descend upon us and remain with us forever. Amen. Amen. God bless. Thank you, God, thank thank you. you so much, everyone, uh, Andy and Father Steve and Melissa. And thank you to all of you who have joined us today. And uh, those sessions are archived, so please uh, go to them if you have missed any of them or you would like to uh, visit any of the other sessions. This is Andy's email. Please email him with any of the questions. 
And uh, again, thank you so much, Andy. Again, as Father Steve said, you are truly a gift to the archdiocese. And again, thank you so much. You're welcome. And, we, forgot and have to make a slide, we forgot to make a slide that said, the end. <laughs> <laughs> no, but and, we have uh, all the suggested reading here. So you can just go to that source, the, the resource page for that. Yes, okay. Okay, and have a great and blessed evening, everyone. Good night and thank Good you. Good night, take care.